the History with Jackson podcast. Hello and welcome to the History with Jackson podcast and welcome to the Catherine of Aragon Festival special series in partnership with Peterborough Cathedral and Peterborough Museum. Now this special series is looking and covering the Catherine of Aragon Festival. We will be speaking to some of the historians who are giving Tudor-focused talks and tours around Peterborough and Peterborough Cathedral. We will also be speaking to some of the amazing living historians who are reenacting parts of Catherine's life. This festival commemorates Catherine's amazing life from the 25th to the 29th of January 2024. And if you hear any part of this festival coverage, do try and get down to Peterborough Cathedral to experience some of the events that we are covering. All the information for the events will be in the description below. And without further ado, let's get into this episode of the Catherine of Aragon Festival Special Series. Okay, so I guess we'll start off with by um, introducing myself and the podcast I'm here for. So I'm here with History of Jackson. Um, I am not Jackson. Jackson is behind the camera today, but um, we're helping out and we're talking with yourself. Um, if you want to give you a brief introduction. Um, my name is Nicola Hibbard. I'm a member of the Medieval Soapman Reenactment Society. And we're here today basically showing people different aspects of Tudor life. And yeah. What we're actually dealing with is painting and artwork. So, obviously, painting and artwork, as we've briefly discussed already, is something that changes its kind of function as we move into the Tudor era. Very much so. Did you want to touch on that? Because you have such a wonderful <laughs> explanation. It's a fascinating theory. Up until this point, the real major patron of the arts has been the church. Of course. Um, and obviously they want certain things done in a certain way. Yeah. And a certain look, because you need to be able to go and enter any church in Christendom yeah. and see up on the wall, that's St Margaret. Yes. That's Each it. icon needs to be recognisable so the illiterate in the population are able to identify and understand what they're seeing. It is. There's also a degree of constancy and comfort in that as well. It doesn't matter where you go, you can see these same saints on the wall yeah. depicted. They are with you always, quite literally anywhere you go. Yeah. So there's that element. But this is an interesting period because you have the rise of the middle classes, the merchant classes. Yeah. A lot of the aristocrats, certainly in this country, in this period, they've been just coming to the end of the Hundred Years' War. Yep. They are flat broke. They have got massive estates. But they also have lots of big castles. They have lots of upkeep there. These are people with power with status, with nay, not much actual cash. Yes. Alternatively, you have the merchant classes. So they have no estates, they have no great houses, but they have got cash, they have got connections, they want to show off. They are the new 1%, the oh, they new are money 1%. The new 1%. <laughs> um, a lot of the aristocrats are not particularly happy about this. In fact, the, have the sumptuary laws brought in. Yeah. These are literary laws saying what you can or cannot wear depending on your status. Interesting, and obviously, if you have like portraits done of you wearing that different Sata symbols, you're going to get in trouble. Oh, you, they were fines, and a lot of people just paid the fine. Oh, but so they'd still <laughs> they'd portray themselves as a higher status, and just they have the money, they can pay pay the authorities off. Yeah, let, let's just say the sumptuary laws were reissued over a period of about 170 years, which wow. shows you just how people completely ignore them. Yes, the as is the way. <laughs> So they've got these, got this merchant class, they've got money, they want to show off. And a wonderful way of doing that is also patrons. Okay. So being patrons of the arts. Yeah. So it's kind of, I want my portrait pit painted. You know, yeah. I've got all these aristocrats, they've got portraits of themselves in their houses and all. I want that too. So you'd have your portrait painted. And you would have basically a portrait party. Incredible. So you'd have all your friends laboured around, <laughs> this big unveiling of this fabulous portrait, and people would go, A, I love it, I want my portrait painted too, but B, equally, I want a picture of you, because yeah. you are my friend, and I would like a copy of that painting. It's like having your friends and family photos hanging on your wall or on your mantelpiece. That's exactly it. And the thing is, it wasn't just confined to this country, because often these are, even, these are traders, these are merchants, they yeah. are connected all the way throughout Europe and even beyond. So you'll be writing to people in Genoa, in Venice, in Marseille. You may never actually meet these people, 
but you'd write them a little letter and say, enclosed is my portrait. You know, I would love to meet you one day. Probably never happen. <laughs> but here is a portrait so you know who you're actually talking to. Just yeah. put a face to the, the letters. Yeah. And they'd go, thank you so much. That's your here is a picture of myself and my wife. So, you know, you've got that connection going on. And of course, these little portraits are part. Some of them are completely different in Europe. Different styles, different clothing, different colours. And people go, I want that colour. You know, I may not have a dress in that colour, but can you paint me in that colour? And somebody else will say, have you seen that new portrait? That colour, I need it. Need it. It becomes fashionable. Trends being exactly. carried from continent to continent, exactly. country to country. You have um, a lot of the bankers at the time. They have, and the Fuggers were a classic example of this. There was a mad craze because the gen young gentleman went to the bank suddenly all started wearing these incredibly pale leather couches. <laughs> and it became a thing to have this unbelievably pale. It, it was a show fit. It was like the latest yeah. Gucci bag. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, so as paintings have evolved, yeah. what were women's position with being painters um, as um, purveyor of the arts? How were they involved? Very, very much so. Um, certainly in stopping the late medieval period, you have women artists actually started being named. Christine de Pisa in her City of Women actually names one of the artists, a lady called Anastasi. Um, basically, she was renowned for her beautiful landscapes and her very detailed sort of floral work. Yeah. If you wanted the best, you went to Anastasi. It's incredible that we've moved away from having monks and abbots of primarily male yeah. gender in the church creating this art to now, in this period, yeah. women being at the forefront. The problem, the problem to be perfectly honest is attribution. Yep. Um, so it's really, up until this period when it's when really people started actually signing off their artwork. Yeah, of course. It's virtually impossible to say who did what. Did we do know of some people, um, but there's also always this bit of a historic assumption, it's the master of so-and-so. Yes. Who would have been the mistress, but we don't know, and art historians in the past have automatically assumed, assumed it had to be a male. I mean, one of the best portraits of her painters of this era is a lovely lady, um, Susanna Hornbaut. Her brother is Lucas Hornbaut, a fabulous painter. Her parents were both painters. She um, was very, very good at a very young age. In fact, her real fame started out when Albrecht Dürer bought one of her pieces. Yeah. And he said it was absolutely astonishing piece of work, exquisite. Couldn't believe it had been done by a woman. So women are getting recognised as the powerhouses of arts that by they deserve artists. by other artists. Yeah. In, it's incredible. It's incredible to mo see this move of just women being celebrated for some things that they are good at and previously have not been acknowledged as yeah. having talent in. I mean, you go a little bit further on, you start to get to um, sort of the later Renaissance, and you get lots of women artists coming through there. Yeah. And it's still a bit of a fight. Most of these women. You start out because your parents do it, your mum does it, yeah. your dad does it, you're born into it, you maybe marry somebody. Yeah. So it's it's kind of a bit of a family tradition. Having said that, for one of the Paris houses, their selling point for all of their artists were women. It's incredible. It's incredible to know that it's a selling point now. It's not just yeah. something that you've got people on the fringe kind of entering in. No, women are the centre of arts. And also you've got very much, from an aristocratic lady's point of view, this is something an aristocratic woman can do. Yeah. Um, if you think, I mean, that goes all the way through. You have Queen Victoria having art lessons. It was something that aristocratic women, you didn't just do your needlework, your, your sewing, your embroidery, your music anymore. Yeah. Art became part of the thing you were taught as well. I mean, some of the, the royal artists throughout the years have been absolutely superb. Yeah. What about Catherine of Aragon? Do you know anything about her interaction with the arts or any art she as, created? As Queen, she would have been a patron. Of course. She would absolutely um, have been a patron of the arts, commissioning pieces. Don't think she actually did, did art. Her real thing was a needlework. Okay. She was a magnificent needlework. We went to a um, workshop the other day about the black work. Oh, and it's stunning. It's absolutely intricate, the time and the meticulous patience to get that it absolutely is, correct. It's exquisite pieces of work. Um, even after she and Henry had separated, she was still making all his shirts for him. Now a little bit more personal to you, um, how did you get into artwork and have you got a favourite Tudor era piece of art? Um, I, was, I was one of those children that basically picked up a brush from about age of two to be perfect, I never stopped scribbling on things. Um, I used to get sort of 
one of my old, old managers she said, said, I'm always slightly nervous when I come in after you've, I've had a day off and you've been in because I don't know what's going to be decorated next. <laughs> um, as regards favourite you know, Tudor era artist, to be perfectly honest, I think Holbein's portrait for sketches, not the actual finished artwork. They're extraordinary. Extraordinary. They just the technicality or just the beauty? They are almost photorealistic. You could look at these portraits and you know perfectly well, if you saw these people walking down the street, you would recognise them. That's incredible. And that's a, it, it's, it's beautiful, beautiful work. And suddenly it's personal. This isn't huge artwork for church and state. These are individual people. Yeah. And suddenly you've got a glimpse into those people's actual reality, those people's lives. To use even the tiny, to use a better uh, modern term, a snapshot, even though they're actual the portraits. Of course, especially because we associate photorealism with quite a modern technique. To see it kind of taking those early stages exactly. in this period is something quite profound, especially because we move away from the style of the church, yeah. which is very, you can, it's very it's identifiable. Stylized. Yeah, absolutely. It's very much. And you suddenly have this whole human element coming mm. in. And again, it always begins, this is the Renaissance, this is people understanding their own ancient cultures and a different way of philosophy, yeah. different ways of actually living in the world, if that makes sense. And you have this flourishing again in art, bringing out those aspects. And it, it's human. You suddenly, these people are suddenly real, as opposed to just names and dates in history books, to be perfectly honest with you. Of course. And um, so following on from that vein, is there any, um, so say, talking social media of the Tudor period, yeah. you've seen this portrait and you're like, I want that dress, I want to wear that. Yeah. Is there any portraits that you really are like, this is the pinnacle of high fashion, high trends, mm. what all the other Tudor women would have wanted <laughs> to have access to of the period? Is that something mean, you would again, know? It, it depends on the actual period we're talking, because just like today, fashion shame, year in, year out, obviously slightly slower in this period. Yes. I mean, this, to be perfectly honest, is would not be a fashionable gown okay. for Catherine de Garrigan's time. It's an earlier period, but it is still good. You're still going to be using it. You're still going to you might cut it down, you might restyle it, but because the material itself is valuable, you're not going to be wasting it. I mean, classically, if you ever see any period, portraits of this period, people are head to toe in black, they are showing off. Black is the single most expensive dye out there. Most blacks in the period are over dyed blues, over dyed browns. So wow, so they have the warmth and black, pigment. Yeah. You are sure. So you'll see an awful lot of these people looking terribly funereal in portraits. Oh no, they're basically wearing the Valentino of the <laughs> day. It's Gucci, it's Versace, eat your heart out, quite frankly. And also a lot of the, the chains. Everything is made by hand. People are showing off. Also, there's an awful lot of fake pearls out there. Ooh, so fake pearls are still a trend, oh, even. Fake, you can't, if you can't afford the real thing, that's fine. You get the, the, you get the nice fake ones invented. Elizabeth I was notorious for it. Really? A lot, of those a lot of them are real. A lot of the ones on the dresses are actually the fake ones. So interesting. Well, thank you so much for You're your time. Um, we look forward to seeing any of your art that you are completing. It looks, <laughs> it looks stunning. But yeah, have thank a great you. rest of the Catherine of Aragon Festival. Thank you. Lovely talking to you. Lovely to talk to you as well. Thank you. Thank you.